This episode is brought to you by Snapple. Want to know another Snapple fact? The first hot air balloon passengers were a sheep, a duck, and a rooster. Ridiculous. Check out Snapple.com to find ridiculously flavored Snapple near you. We took it all. We brought them to our land. An endless night. Ember hot and icy cold. The rage of the earth. We made this curse. Carved it in the blood on our backs. We did not see. We could not, but she did. And in the end, what will I become? Senwa Saga. Hellblade 2. Play it now with Game Pass. Sunday, February 4th, and this is Doing The Thing. I'm James Gilmore, and I'm here with Wizard Radio Station's Anishka Rai. Hello. And Nathan Eckersley. Hello. And we're going to be talking about everything happening in our worlds this week. Guys, how are you, Anishka? How are you doing? I'm great, thank you. How are you? I'm all right, thanks. Nathan, how are you? Not too bad, thanks fantastic if you're listening live on wizard radio station where we do the thing live every sunday from 8 p.m uk time you can get involved by tweeting us on dming us on instagram and twitter at wiz radio you can text us at no extra cost only standard network rate supply 07 807 183 538 and all of our contact details on the website wizardradio.com all right so tonight is the grammys i wanted to throw this into the group are you guys following the grammys at all or anything happening this weekend that's um, a resounding little right? bit I'm, i must say i'm not too <laughs> yeah a, a little bit i'm uh, i'm not exactly the most avid follower of the, the grammys but uh, i've heard a few songs uh, i admit i'm a, a little bit of a swifty on the quiet but uh not not the world's biggest fan I have to say and what about you, Anishka? Yeah, I mean, I have to admit this year, same as Nathan, really. I haven't really been too, like, following it too much. But sort of just, just through the great Brian, I've heard a few things here and there. And I'm obviously aware of of um, the main people who have been nominated. So, yeah. Yeah. I mean, this is a conversation we've had on this show before. But do you guys think that award shows, in which case, are less relevant than they've ever been because i feel like the, you know the grammys is one of the major award ceremonies and i don't know i feel like your answers are not that out of the blue nathan what do you think yeah i mean the, there's some things to be said that there's still a role for uh award ceremonies you know they, they certainly give an indication of what's been popular what's working what isn't they give a, a good indication of where like, the, the real cultural moments have been in the last year or so and whilst they haven't been following too much around the, the Grammys, if you look at, say, some of the Oscar nominations as well, you know, you've got the big hits like um, Oppenheimer in there, uh, Maestro, The Holdovers as well, doing really well, Killers of the Flower Moon, you know, again, in sparking important conversations about representation. But at the same time, a lot of debate around the role of Barbie in, in the Oscars as well, the, the controversial snubbing of Greta Gerwig and Margot Robbie in there, but yet Ryan Gosling gets nominated for Ken. Now, I, I like Barbie. I thought it was a great film, really entertaining. Didn't really think it was Oscar worthy, though. I don't know about you two, but I, I don't know. It's, I think it's certainly a good indicator on where the barometer of public opinion is on broader cultural issues and film, music, all the rest of it. But I, th- I think they are starting to dwindle in relevance and popularity. Yeah, I think um, for me, like, I I think that the Grammys, obviously, they just sort of reflect a celebration of everything that's sort of come um, within the last year. And it's just a chance really for for iconic pop stars, iconic celebrities um, to really just like reunite once more. So I think it's quite nice because it can kind of be a reminder as well. It's obviously Mariah Carey's hosting. Um, but yeah, like I, I think that it, it really depends because obviously 
now definitely there's more of a platform to like be a little bit more um there's more i think diversity throughout oscars and grammys as well so i think that's obviously kind of relates to and reflects c the current cultural times too so i think that there is still a place and there's still a lot of keen interest but it i guess it just depends on the person like for me this time around i've just sort of been sort of a little bit more indifferent um but yeah i think they're still very much relevant but just perhaps people are now obviously looking at at there's a lot more sources of of music and people's interests and, and minds are a lot more kind of open to to a lot of different things do you think nathan on your point because you said around like the snubbing at the oscars of barbie but obviously like it's clear barbie last year was the most culturally relevant film not just of the year but of the last few years really um do you think that the fact that that got snubbed makes the Oscars less relevant or does it highlight more that just like the criteria is different? I think it's more the last point, actually. The, the criteria are certainly different. So I remember the, a couple of years ago, there was a big conversation about uh, including a kind of people's category or uh, a category around reflecting on the best performing films of the year. And then because at the time, that was around the conversation where the Marvel films were absolutely massive. They were huge blockbuster events. And post-lockdown, post-COVID and everything, Marvel films haven't been doing anywhere near as well as they were previously. I mean, the Marvel series that's been coming on to Disney Plus as well, they've been doing appallingly badly in comparison to, say, when there was a big hype around them first going on to Disney Plus once Disney did the partnership with Marvel. So... You know, there was a conversation around the importance of having those kind of big cultural moments reflected in the award ceremonies. But I think particularly with Barbie, it, it, it kind of comes into that sort of middle bracket of, yes, there were some excellent performances, like Ryan Gosling did play Ken very well. Margot Robbie was a very good Barbie. But if you compare that with Killian Murphy as J. Roberts Oppenheimer, if you compare it to Paul Giamatti in The Holdovers, uh, L Lily Gladstone in uh, Killers of the Flower Moon, that, that sort of thing. Do those performances really stand out against Bradley Cooper as Leonard Bernstein, for example, in Maestro? I don't think they did. So wh whilst I take your point, there's a, definitely an element of snubbing in there, perhaps even uh, sort of turning your nose up at something like Barbie, which you know, in many ways was just uh, an advertising opportunity for things like Mattel, the manufacturer of Barbie, or Hyundai, where they had the big, the big car chase and mm. very prominently focusing the Hyundai SUV. You know, does that really fit in with the Oscar categories? I'm not sure it does. But uh, undoubtedly, you kind of have to take each performance as it comes. But I, if, if I were on the nominating committee, I wouldn't have put Ryan Gosling alongside Killian Murphy and but the thing Bradley is, Cooper, for example. So th this gets into a really interesting discussion over what the point of an awards like this is. Because you're right, the uh, Oscars in many ways, I mean, it is kind of a popularity contest because people vote, lots and lots of people vote for who they think did best. Uh, but it's not a popula popularity contest of the public. It's kind of like, okay, if this is a vote purely based on performance and skill, then how do we know that Killian Murphy gave one of the best performances? There are so many films internationally and even just domestically in the US that maybe didn't get so much attention. So is this just now voting on the performances of out of the most popular films? Is that what the Academy represents? Or does there need to be some sort of like populism within this? It's really difficult. Anushka, what do you think? I don't know. I mean, I think in order to draw attention to these award ceremonies, there's still going to have to be some connection to, you know, popularism in general. I guess with what Nathan said about, you know, Ryan Gosling, yeah, I wouldn't say his performance. It was very bold. I think it's a fact, the fact that it was very bold. And we, at the moment, like we're living in a time where everyone is sort of pushing the boundaries. Everyone is questioning sort of traditional paradigms. So I, I feel like, in order for award ceremonies to sort of still be relevant and as popular as they have been, they will sort of need to kind of, to really sort of maybe capitalize on what is popular to a degree as well in order to keep staying relevant. That's what I feel, but, but I don't know. Yeah, I mean, just, just on that point, Anushka though, I mean, you, 
if, if, we, if we take, for example, when things were kind of trying to recover after lockdowns and COVID and all the rest of it around the world, the entertainment history was, industry was massively hit. You know, there were so many issues. And one could argue quite convincingly that Tom Cruise saved the film industry with Top Gun Maverick. You know, that performed amazingly well. It was kind of the first big blockbuster to come out after restrictions were lifted, people were starting to go out again. And yet there had to be some kind of recognition of that because... A, it was just a really good, entertaining, interesting film with great performances. And Tom Cruise is just Tom Cruise. He's great. But if you compare that to some of the other films that were coming out in 2022, yeah, 2022, you know, it certainly wasn't Oscar worthy, but yet you kind of have to recognize the impact it had. And that's why the film was nominated for Best Picture, even though it was obviously never going to win. There had to be some kind of recognition of that. So I, th I think you're onto something there, Anushka. There has to be a kind of recognition of the popular movement behind films, behind the, the cultural impact that they're having. But at the same time, again, does it stand up against this traditional Oscar-style films? I, I don't know. Maybe there is a case for a, a popularity, not necessarily a popularity contest, but some kind of recognition of performance of films that wouldn't necessarily get recognised. I definitely yeah, I think... think... So, so... Oh, no, no. Anushka, after you. Oh, yeah, I was gonna say. So I haven't actually seen that the Tom Cruise Top Gun film. I have to admit, but I do think that um, in order for things to sort of, you know, no matter what it is, you know, media award ceremonies, in order to to stay relevant, they have to grow with the times, and there has to be that sort of um, that sense of evolution. And in media studies, I remember there was a term called zeitgeist, and zeitgeist basically means like the spirit of the times. So that does have to be captured to some degree. Now, obviously, it doesn't necessarily mean what's popular has to sort of interfere necessarily with the traditional structure of what of how something has been, like, you know, the Oscars, the award ceremony. But there, I guess there has to be some acknowledgement. Um, and obviously, Nathan used the word recognition. I think that is really important. But yeah, sorry, James, what were you going to say? No, I, I agree. I think it's difficult, particularly now, the state that if we just look at the Oscars that the film industry is in, where like Top Gun Maverick, Nathan, to your point, saved the film industry. Barbie this summer saved the film industry and uplifted Oppenheimer at the same time. Like it's, I think particularly because a film like, you know, those Marvel films, they are no longer certifiable hits. Like there's no such thing as a guaranteed success in terms of getting people out to uh, cinemas nowadays. Um, you know, we know that the economics around streaming services are not you know as rigid as people thought they were so it feels like we're in this time where the film industry is you know really fighting back from a potential very dark future and these films that are massively not necessarily outperforming but leading the pack by so far like those two standouts we mentioned it's more than just this is a great film or this was a popular film or this was the most popular film. They actually brought people back to the cinema. And I they will probably hope, I mean, I guess film studios are hoping that this year there'll be another film this summer that will bring people that weren't coming back, that hadn't come back to the cinema post-COVID yet, back to the cinema. It does feel like that needs some sort of special recognition. It feels like actually um t uh tom cruise and the top gun maverick team needed some sort of special recognition of the role that their film has played in culture and in the industry feels like this year barbie deserved some sort of proper recognition you know and i think the way the public were hoping to see that was best director nomination best actress nomination it's obviously got best picture anyway and best supporting um, as well but you know they wanted to see a sweep of rewards there should be some other way surely to um, mark this moment and then this year as well because i think we are no longer in that era where big franchise comes out ex you know based on existing intellectual property everybody's going to go to the cinema we're just not living in that anymore but i don't know what do you think I think there's certainly a case to be made for that. I mean, you know, with all the major award ceremonies, we we have the kind of Lifetime Achievement Award, don't we, for some like stalwart of the entertainment industry, someone who's been uh, an actor or a director for like 50, 60 odd years, who's been top of their game, 
Yeah, and so right, rightfully, deservedly, they get recognised for that lifetime achievement. So maybe there kind of needs to be a, a, a special recognition award, a special recognition category for something which undeniably has made a mm. fundamental impact on the entertainment industry for that year. So like 2022, you could very clearly make the case for Top Gun Maverick. Uh, for uh, this year, easily Barbie. Um, but as for 2024, who, I mean, who knows what that could be? We don't uh, have a, a full slate on what's going to come out. Dune Part 2 is probably going to do really well. But as, as you said, James, you know, people are still being tempted to go back to the cinemas now, aren't they? There's, you know, there's still some people who haven't quite got there yet. So, you know, I mean, this probably leads on to something else about splitting you know, TV series and films into parts one, two and three. But, you know, Dune, it did well, considering the, the circumstances in which it came out. It was obviously you know, running alongside Top Gun Maverick as this post-lockdown film slate. But yet, now that you've got that sort of solid backing behind it, Dune Part 2, maybe that's going to be this year's big blockbuster hit, which will make a massive contribution to the film industry, generate uh, millions and millions of dollars in box office sales. And again, maybe there's some recognition of that. And again, it's a, also a means of recognizing the talent within there as well. I feel like with that's a really good um, it's a really good idea, Nathan. And, and I feel like with Barbie, what made it so special is the fact that it really drew upon the sense of well, especially for me, it drew upon the sense of nostalgia. And obviously, just the audience, it was so, the audience itself was so diverse. Like I have, I, mean, I went to watch it with a male friend of mine and he he hates sort of, you know, anything girly, he's not in, interested in those type of films. But even he came along and obviously there are a lot of mums and daughters in the cinema too. So I think it actually, it was really smart because it captured sort of the sense of nostalgia um, within the film industry in two ways. So first of all, obviously, just with, with Barbie, um, the toy itself, and then be with the the experience of going back to the cinema and being in the cinema once more. Um, and I think that's what made it so special because when you do sort of, nostalgia is so powerful when you do kind of really like, um, you want to enjoy it to the fullest. So I think seeing it at home wouldn't have been the same as sort of going to the cinema and sharing that with everybody in the cinema too. You know, when people are laughing at like Ryan Gosling and just, you know, it, it it was such a special experience. So I think that itself is what also made Barbie so special last year. It's interesting. I feel like, and maybe I've read this entire situation wrong. What I find interesting about Barbie as a film is that traditionally it felt like the kind of films that shaped culture were targeted at teenagers. And now it feels like the age has moved up a bit. Barbie was really targeted to a kind of 20 plus, 21, 22, because of that nostalgia element. A lot of the big films, like one of the only genres nowadays that is dependable, it just doesn't bring as big audiences in, but they are much cheaper films, are horror films. Like those sorts of horror and genre films perform really well at the cinema now post COVID in the way that they didn't before. That's obviously an 18 plus audience. I think it's really interesting that we're talking about a film like Barbie that's cross-generational. Actually, that film was really targeted at, like, older Gen Z. It wasn't targeted at 12, 13, 14-year-olds, like a lot of films when I was growing up were, those kind of culture-moving films. It was a bit older. I kind of feel like we're seeing that in society a little bit more, even if you think about your pop stars. Like, I don't know about you guys, but I remember being younger and, like, you know, pop stars were my age. When I was 12, Justin Bieber was like 13, 14. Like, they were really young. I couldn't tell you a single pop star nowadays who's an early teenager. Everybody's older. And I think there's something really interesting in what's happening in society right now. And that's kind of having this shift on pop culture and what's working. It's where the money is. Think about Taylor Swift. Yes, lots of kids like her. But Taylor Swift is an artist that people also have nostalgia for. And her average fan is probably 21 plus years old. I think that's really interesting. Um, I don't know, Anushka, what do you think? Um, well, from my experience, just to draw up on the last point that you said, I was um, teaching at summer school last summer and it was full of teenagers. And the teens were, they were avid, like they were just yeah, avid Taylor Swift fans. They love Taylor Swift and um, were constantly playing it 
playing her playlist during downtime. And I don't know. I mean, I, I think that Taylor has an ability through her music, through her charm, through her aura, through, I guess, her sense of, you know, people are quite curious about her um, and, you know, f f due to different reasons, really. She's quite, she's been quite sort of outspoken and vocal about different things as well, her relationship history. So I feel like she is, for me, I feel like she's quite relatable to any age, um, but for different reasons. So, but that's yeah. not, that's not what used to happen. Like the big pop star of the day used to be somebody that teens loved, everybody older hated. And I think that's, I don't know, Nathan, what do you think? I see what you're saying, yeah. Yeah, I, th I think it's definitely, so, uh, you're, you're definitely on something. But if we go back to film for a minute, I remember reading last, last summer, there was a really interesting article. I can't remember which outlet it was in, but it was kind of doing a survey of the types of films that younger people are going to see. And you kind of traditionally you'd have sort of like your 12 to 15 year olds going to see like the, the latest Marvel film, a superhero film, action thing, uh, that, that sort of thing. Some, something more akin to Barbie, you know, that, that sort of film. But actually now younger audiences are going towards probably more in the 15 to 18 bracket. They're actually going more towards cinema in the traditional sense. So rather than going for the Marvel films, which have their core fan base, the people who are going to go to the cinema to watch a Marvel film, irrespective of uh, whether they like that particular superhero or villain or whatever. They are just solid Marvel fans. They will go to that film. But actually, more 15 to 18 year olds are going for actual traditional cinema. So uh, Wes Anderson's Asteroid City did really well with that mm. demographic. Uh, Oppenheimer as well. I mean, I think some are probably a bit too young to see it, but you know, Oppenheimer did really well in that uh, younger age bracket, and probably a lot of that is to do with the Barbenheimer rhetoric that was going on around, and you know, so much of the social media commentary around it. You know, they wanted to make that comparison for themselves, but fundamentally, I just thought it was really interesting at the time how much those attitudes have shifted towards going for probably a much more thought-provoking, much more traditional style of cinema rather than just going to the big blockbuster it's interesting i wonder if a part of it also is that like traditionally you've wanted to go to the things that people the generation up are interested in that's a lot of how youth culture is defined and so if to people now superhero movies either are no longer interesting or seem a bit childish to them then the next generation up are, yeah, yeah, you know, we're the generation that grew up with the Dark Knights and those sorts of, like, Christopher Nolan superhero films, which felt very different to superhero films nowadays. And, yeah, like Oppenheimer and these uh, bigger spectacles. I also just wanted to note, actually, last night I was watching, it was on um, Sky or whatever, and Now You See Me, the film with um, Jesse Eisenberg. Oh, great film. And I just thought, God, this film, if this film was made today, would just go direct to Netflix. There's no way this would yeah. have been released in a cinema. There is a whole category of film because it might feel like a big film because that film is big. It's New York City and Vegas and it's amazingly shot. But, um, you know, it's not based on existing IP and it's not a genre film, as they'd call it. So I don't know if that would even get made nowadays. If it would, it would be on half the budget and put on Netflix. Yeah, absolutely. I, I absolutely love Now You See Me. And, and even the second one as well. Is, I think that was probably one of the rare instances where a sequel is just as good as the first one. But yeah, as you say, that sort of concept now, it would go straight to streaming. It, you know, it, I don't think it would even get a, a look in. Or if a, if a streaming service was particularly confident about it, like Netflix, they might give it a limited cinema run just so... Yeah, viewers could have that experience but you're, you're right the, the whole culture around that sort of thing has shifted and yeah you know, i mean I, I love a good heist film or heist series and you know something like kaleidoscope that was out on netflix last year which was a really interesting concept about um it, it was a, a high story following all sorts of different characters but the netflix algorithm gave each viewer a different running order to it so like someone will start it with the heist itself and how everything's gone horribly wrong but then the following episode will be episode two in the story followed by episode five then episode one and jump around but the, so the idea was that 
every viewer would view it in a different way. And there was something ridiculous, like uh, 3,000 different combinations of how you could watch this series. It, it was mad. But you're, you're absolutely right. That's the kind of concept of, uh, of a, a bit of a cheesy idea of a high, something that's kind of been done a million times, but with a different twist on it. You know, a, f a few years ago, that would have been quite a pull for someone to say, well, I've seen a few of those things before, but yeah, I've, I've got nothing to do on a Saturday. I'll, I'll go to the cinema, watch it. And it'd be a bit of a, a social event. You might bring a, a friend or two, go up something to eat afterwards. But now, as you say, that kind of concept, if it is kind of a, a variation on a theme, that would just go straight to a streamer. Mm, it's really interesting um i think we're going to be back after this and we're going to talk much more about the celebrities and pop culture but through the lens of the impact that they can have on the world but we'll be right back after this we took it all we brought them to our land an endless night ember hot and icy cold the rage of the earth we made this curse Carved it in the blood on our backs. We did not see. We could not, but she did. And in the end... What will I become? Senwa Saga. Hellblade 2. Play it now with Game Pass. Step into the world of power, loyalty, and luck. I'm gonna make him an offer he can't refuse. With family, cannolis, and spins mean everything. Now, you wanna get mixed up in the family business. Introducing... The Godfather at ChompaCasino.com. Test your luck in the shadowy world of the Godfather slot. Someday, I will call upon you to do a service for me. Play the Godfather now at ChompaCasino.com. Welcome to the family. No purchase necessary. VGW Group. Voidware prohibited by law. 18 plus. Terms and conditions apply. Hey guys, it is Ryan. I'm not sure if you know this about me, but I'm a bit of a fun fanatic when I can. I like to work, but I like fun too. It's a thing. And now the truth is out there. I can tell you about my favorite place to have fun. Chumba Casino. They have hundreds of social casino style games to choose from with new games released each week. You can play for free anytime, anywhere and each day brings a new chance to collect daily bonuses. So join me in the fun. Sign up now at ChumbaCasino.com. No purchase necessary. VTW. Void or prohibited by law. See terms and conditions 18 plus. Welcome back. This is Doing The Thing. I'm James Gilmore. I'm joined by Wizard Radio Station's Anushka Rai and Nathan Eckersley. Guys, how are you doing? All good, thanks. How are you? Good, thank you. Anushka, good, how yeah, are you? Thank you? I'm great, thanks. Yeah, I hope you guys are good too fantastic so in the first half of the show we are talking a lot about award shows but also the kind of state i think of tv and film and music in particular um and i wanted to talk about something that i feel like plays into your area of expertise a bit nathan with the impact that celebrities can have on the world stage particularly with regards to politics because we are in potentially one of the biggest years for democracy in recent times billions of people around the world going to the polls and we know the impact that celebrities can have on that so nathan talk to me a little bit about a little bit about this yeah absolutely and you're you're right this is a huge year for democracy 2024 i mean uh, there's an estimate done by the guardian that reckons there's going to be approximately two billion people going to the polls this year in approximately 40 countries and some of those include the uk and the us obviously but also some other key players so uh, india goes to the polls later this year uh, we've just had an election in taiwan uh, you know so many and of course the, the european parliament which uh, i'll come back to the european parliament in a sec because the thing that's been really interesting to me over the last few months and it's something i've been thinking of covering on my my own show recently but world events have got in the way which is kind of the political economy of celebrity and how celebrities are impacting major global events, the, the, the way our world works. And in particular, you cannot deny, as we were discussing earlier, you cannot deny or get around the fact that Taylor Swift is just a huge, undeniable global phenomenon. And I, I was reading this report uh, earlier this week, which absolutely blew my mind. So since Taylor Swift started uh, dating Travis Kelsey, uh, when was that? Like October, this, November? Was, yeah, this yeah, was the end of last year, yeah. And end of last year, yeah. So, yeah. so since Taylor Swift started dating Travis Kelsey, she has generated the equivalent brand value of $331.5 million for the, the Kansas City Chiefs and the NFL, which is just an astonishing amount of money. 
I mean, the fact that there's going to be the rumours of will she or won't she be at the match to watch Travis? You know, is, is she going? Is she going to be there? If she is, what will she be wearing? That impacts the the fashion market. So it gets on social media as well. It's not just the direct impact she will have on the Kansas economy or the uh, income generated by the NFL. But it's on everything that sort of drips down from that. And I, I just think it's absolutely fascinating how Taylor Swift is just the, the woman of the moment of the mo- of right now and how she could potentially sway future elections. Yeah. I think she's... Sorry. I think, yeah, she's a pretty forthright lady. And I remember... Um... In the 2020 election she she actually posted a message on twitter like that was sort of basically challenging um donald trump um and she was you know in favor of of joe biden so she really does have i think she also inspires other people who potentially may not really be that interested in politics to step up and and vote because they might if they identify with her and if they respect her then he, she's a huge influencer um unintentionally or intentionally I don't know when it comes to politics but yeah she definitely has sort of like power in that area for sure I think it's interesting and with that I was just going to say Nathan because this feels like the reverse conversation of what was happening just a few years ago when it felt like the power of celebrity was waning and like Mm -hmm. the power of celebrity endorsements in politics felt like they'd never meant less but now they've obviously got such huge potential impact Absolutely. And you're right. There, there was a, a point where people are thinking, oh, so what? Uh, who cares what Justin Bieber has to say on who, who's running for Congress? That kind of thing. You know, it, it, it was kind of seen as celebrities were inserting themselves into situations. But now when you've got such a huge figure like Taylor Swift, not only are people trying to court her opinion, court her endorsement, but also she's she's directly impacting the the broader conversation about w- world affairs. So there was a, a New York Times article uh, over the last couple of weeks that was actually showing that the, the Biden campaign is framing its youth strategy around getting Taylor Swift's explicit endorsement, which is absolutely mm-hmm. mind-blowing. You know, you, you wouldn't even have thought that would be a, a conversation being had ju- just a, a couple of years ago. E- even in 2020, when Biden was going for... Uh, the presidency against, against Donald Trump. You know, it was it was kind of seen as a plus if she was going to support Biden. She obviously had a huge following, but to make getting her endorsement a core strategy of getting their youth vote out there, that is absolutely huge. But even if we just take it a step back, the impact of the Eras Tour has been phenomenal. You know, it's been all over the world with it, absolutely packed out stadiums in every country she'd been to. To the point where the president of Chile, uh, Gabriel Boric, actually sent her a, an official request from his office to say, please come to Chile. You will make a direct contribution to our economy. Again, when she was doing the North America leg of the tour, there was a massive controversy about the fact that she'd not done any dates for Canada, to which the Canadian parliament, led by the then speaker of the Canadian House of Commons, actually wrote to her to say, please add some dates for Canada. We've got constituents who want to see you. We've got uh, a, a tremendous amount of support for you in Canada. We've got stadiums waiting for you to perform in. And it's absolutely, uh, to me, I, I just can't get my head around the fact that how one person is able to command the attention of all these world leaders. When you look at everything that's going on around the world at the moment, they, they're all desperately saying, please, Taylor Swift, come and perform in our country so you can generate more for our economies. I mean, it's interesting because in the music industry, everything's measured by what's known as market share. So how much of the overall music market consumption do the record labels um, each kind of contribute to? You know, is it Universal has X percent and whatever. And um, they worked out this for 2023 that Taylor Swift by herself generated just over 1% of the global music market share, which is, you know, that like that's more than all of Disney's music in 2023. Like it's crazy. This one artist, as you say, Nathan has, you know, 
just such a massive audience and, and such avid fans as well because doing all of this without actually even being for a long time the number one artist on spotify like it's because she has so much music that so many people listen to anushka it looks like you want to say something yeah i just well it's the first time actually i heard about the canadian parliament writing to her i didn't know it's it's news for me um but i mean just like i said before the before the break i was teaching in a summer school and there were a lot of international students and something you know as a teacher we had to sort of identify what universally drew everybody together and guys girls you know latin america to people in kazakhstan Taylor Swift was one of those universal factors. So she really had such a powerful um, presence among, amongst, you know, all the nationalities. And I feel like, you know, obviously, perhaps we you were saying earlier that maybe, you know, in the past, celebrities were just sort of considered just the influence of celebrities was considered to be waning. But maybe, it, you know, food for thought, perhaps it's because now we've got to know through social media, we've had more access to getting to know celebrities as people um, on a day-to-day -day basis. So we feel like we can understand them more, identify with them a bit more. There's not so much of a gap. People are obviously becoming more aware of um, not sort of just idolizing and putting people on a pedestal as much as we did in the past um, for, for without sort of any reason. And I think, yeah, a lot of people can identify with Taylor and she has that that likability factor that relatability factor things that she's been through you know without Cole Kanye was I think it was Kanye West yeah. the, there was a Kanye West incident like yeah. years ago the way she handled that you know she has um she's definitely she's definitely I think she's gained a lot of people's respect um just by how she how she is so yeah I kind of think she deserves the this this power that she has really um as long as she continues to use it in a, in a Nathan, way. do you think though? Good? Nathan, do you think she's actually going to endorse any candidate in the US? It just feels so unlikely. It does feel unlikely, but you know, if, it, if she'd previously in, uh, get voice support for Joe Biden in in twenty twenty, you know, there's a there's a strong chance she'll probably do it in twenty four. Whether or not it's an official endorsement, I I don't know. But you know, there's clearly some pull factor with her. And even taking a step back from the US, I mentioned before as part of this, what The Guardian was calling a democracy Super Bowl, which is just an awful Americanism. But, you know, this democracy Super Bowl, one of the elections that's happening, as I mentioned before, is the European Parliament. And so in an interview that the, the vice president of the European Commission did, a, a guy called Margarita Skinas, he did an interview in which he's actually encouraging Taylor Swift to when, when she comes to Europe on a concert or a tour or whatever, actually asking her to encourage younger people to go out and vote. So, you, you know, the, the Biden campaign is obviously hoping that she will you know, encourage that youth vote to come out. She will give Biden that official endorsement. But the fact that you've also got an election that's going to take place in 27 countries in which one person is hoping that she will encourage young people in those 27 countries to go out and vote in, if they're eligible. Again, it's just immense and especially with the the amount she's generating at the moment you, you know the, it was estimated that she she's generating between two and five billion dollars each year which is like the equivalent of a, a caribbean the country's economy as well which is just insane doing that every year undoubtedly politicians are going to be wanting a, a piece of that pie and like with the canadian parliament writing to her like the biden campaign you know, focusing on her being the, the key to unlocking the youth vote. You know, I think, I think there's a good chance of her endorsing Biden, but whether or not it's an official or just voicing support, I guess that'll remain to be seen. Yeah, I think it's interesting. I think that, you know, Taylor Swift, arguably the most po powerful person in the world at the moment, genuinely, because of her power through culture, her making such an outward political comment now at the height of her power this she would know there's so much power that comes with that i think also possibly one of the concerns might be that there is no guarantee as to what the outcome of this election is going to be and if i was taylor swift that would be a risk because that would be a well if she endorses the candidate and that candidate doesn't win then now suddenly it looks like her power has waned 
actually like a lot of the things that Taylor Swift has politically gotten involved in recently have been more on issues of rights, issues of the way she thinks the world should be, you know, LGBTQ plus rights, things like that, misjustices more than actually a um, a very contentious election where there is going to be an outcome. People know the date of that outcome already. And the impact of that could reflect on the people that endorse various sides. I was reading an article last week about Judge Judy, uh, personally one of my favourite celebrities, um, who's come out to endorse um, Nikki Haley. And um, the article itself referenced the fact that uh, Judge Judy has in, had endorsed Michael Bloomberg um a few years ago and you know it literally the article says that you know it puts into question actually the value of her endorsement to begin with and i think when you're a massive global music superstar that soft power is everything the kind of idea of your influence is possibly more powerful than your actual influence so putting it to the test like that would not be something that should be taken lightly De- definitely and as, as you say you know who knows what's going to happen i mean american politics is so upside down at the moment anything really could happen and you know it's not beyond the realm of possibility that donald trump secures the republican nomination and ends up uh, rerunning 2016 where biden may get the popular vote but he wins uh, in terms of the number of states supporting him and so if that does happen you know, that, that will put Taylor Swift in a very difficult position of, yes, more people supported my candidate, but he still didn't win. What does that say about my, my star power, my, the impact of my voice on that as well? And again, I suppose for those other world leaders who've been trying to court her to bring her to their countries to, again, make that uh, generation into the economy. You know, you know, are they going to have that same demand of her as well? Again, it's going to be a fascinating year for Taylor Swift and her impact on world politics. Feels a bit unfair. Like, you know, we're here talking about is Taylor Swift going to wade into one of the most important elections in, and that's just in America, but in the world, and then all of these other elections, or does she just want to go on tour, sing some songs and make a load of money? Um, it's kind of... Yeah. <laughs> a, a difficult one. Uh, Anushka, in the break, you brought up something interesting on a completely different note, um, which I thought as we kind of have a 10, 15 minutes left on this show is definitely worth bringing up um, around I don't know, the kind of role and self-esteem of men in society. I'd love to throw to you on this. Yeah, I think it was just basically just inspired by, you know, we were talking about Barbie earlier, we we're talking about Ryan Gosling and his role in Barbie earlier as well. And um, it's just something that it's a conversation that crops up quite a lot. So I have um, a friend of mine who is older than me, but they have teenage sons. And they, they were saying recently that one thing that they have found that their sons are struggling with, and a lot of their son's friends are struggling with at school at the moment. Um, they're basically having like an identity crisis. And feeling slightly emasculated because obviously nowadays in society and um, within culture there's a lot of awareness and emphasis with women being able to do you can do anything you want you can be anything you want and it's almost like because there's been so much focus on that the boys are sort of not they're kind of questioning where they stand because I guess they're feeling like they can't sort of they're afraid, you know, we live in a time where you have to be sort of very, you know, politically correct. And there's just sort of a sense of not really knowing where they stand anymore. And I guess sort of feeling a limbo between traditional male sort of roles that have been, um, you know, criticized in the past. And then now, and obviously now there's a lot more emphasis on, on men, which I think can be positive, but men like, you know, being more vulnerable, being more open about their emotions um, and things like that, which, you know, I think in the past there was too much of the opposite. But now, you know, I think a lot of a lot of young boys are, are, are feeling this. And um, it's just, yeah, sort of like quite a, there's not like one solution overnight, but I think it's quite interesting to discuss. I think the idea of the emasculation bit's interesting to me because... I guess it puts into question what like men's role in society is, especially if that is in response to like this incredible wave of female empowerment 
because there's no reason why like you know to, in my eyes at least and anushka nathan disagree with me if you'd like um there's no reason why that would directly interfere with like the traditional well maybe the traditional men's role but the modern man's role in society like that's nothing that shouldn't be anything around preventing a woman's opportunity if anything it should be around enabling opportunity right um and using like the privilege and, and position that particularly white men have in society uh, to help lift other people up and there's a kind of a positive enablement role in that which i so i think i understand the uh, the identity bit really quick re really clearly uh because there is i think particularly a lot of negativity even kind of in what i just said right around highlighting specifically white men as having this position that dialogue i can imagine if you are just like a young guy in primary school going into secondary school these would be quite confusing messages to understand because they're, they are complicated in themselves and massive over generalizations so I, I don't know i think it's interesting anushka it sounded like you were going to say something yeah um just sorry nathan i know you want to say something as well but just before like oh, i was course. reading this blog online by a a career and life coach um an american career and life coach and he's called marty memco and he basically was saying that you know, today's media leaders, they were relentlessly told how oppressive men were and men have been, and that schools are starting to get more and more feminized. So consequently, boys feel more confused, you know, just about where they where they fit and where they are. And they're constantly taught that masculinity is almost like an antisocial trait that needs to be extinguished. So there just doesn't really seem to be any sort of clarity in terms of sense of direction. Um, so that's just also something I wanted to highlight too. Yeah, I mean, it's it's interesting. It's in, it's, it's a really fascinating topic, and th there does seem to be this kind of crisis of masculinity at the moment. You know, what is the role of men? Because as you you said, Anushka, you know, there's a, a huge conversation going on at the moment uh, about women's empowerment. You know, promoting uh, women in the workplace and you know, ins ensuring uh, gender equality, which you know is a fantastic thing and something that we should celebrate. But we also need to look at the the impact this is having on men, for example. And if we look at education, for example, statistically speaking, white working class boys are the most left behind in education in, in the UK and the United States and uh, in a couple of other European countries as well. You know, when we compare uh, demographics and socioeconomic factors, white working class boys are significantly behind in terms of attainment and performance compared to some of their other classmates. Uh, similarly as well, if just broadly speaking on men in society you know suicide is the biggest killer of men under 40 and you know the, the, there has to be a reason for that there has to be some kind of acknowledgement of that that if we're seeing this huge disparity for white working class boys if we're seeing this the fact that suicide is the biggest killer for men under 40 you know there does have to be some recognition of a perhaps a, a greater or even more equal role for men in society and you know, last year, there was the whole conversation about the role of Andrew Tate and his influence on social media and th this truly awful, toxic bloke who's uh, saying, yes, well, all, all young men need to aspire to be like me and enroll in my uh, online university at a cost of thousands of dollars. And it, it will teach you how to um, win over attractive women and teach you how to buy massive houses and drive fast cars and all the rest of it. That's not what masculinity is. Andrew Tate was a symptom, not the problem. And so you, know, you, you have to be able to identify what the root of that is. And fundamentally, I think particularly in the world of social media, in the way our discourse has evol evolved and evaluated, it's about trying to find an equal place where we recognize the contribution men have had, we recognize what's been holding them back and try to find some kind of parity with also addressing the historical imbalances with women as well. And perhaps through the recognition also, one thing that's quite important to highlight is erasing the sense of guilt that um has kind of kind of been imposed upon young men in mm. schools when it hasn't really been their fault you know and i think due to that they're almost perhaps stifled and could potentially feel backed into a corner and i think that's what's really unfair and that's quite crucifying because obviously you know it's not their fault um they weren't in control of what came before them and just to just to touch upon what you said regarding andrew tate and that con his con his idea of masculinity that's obviously just one narrative that's pushed but i think one thing that's positive is that 
people are waking up and becoming more aware of the fact that that it can be quite toxic um masculinity to be masculine you know it's it's I, th- I don't know i think that whole notion of masculinity just it thrives upon insecurity and ego and it's not it's not healthy like you can't really have a positive relationship based come from that approach and um it's just sometimes well i just think now people are becoming more aware of it and it's not as celebrated that particular approach to life is not as celebrated as it was before but then i guess it's like what's that bridge between between how things have been and you know the direction that we want to go in and maybe maybe boy, young men don't even know what direction they're supposed to be going in based on the fact that they might feel left behind there's been constant talk and jargon about how oppressive they've been and and you know i, I obviously can me you know being a female i can understand that and i understand about you know how like you know a lot of people the whole sense of patriarchy and things but i do feel for especially for teenage boys um who haven't done anything and do have this sense of guilt that they have to navigate through and i just find it really unfair i think it's I think it's really interesting. As you were talking there, uh, talking about masculinity, and then I guess by contrast, femininity. femininity um, there is this, like, it feels like to you to say nowadays uh, around like to call somebody masculine that it feels like a bit like an insult. Like it feels like a bit of a dirty area. I think my my reading of this situation, which which again could be wrong, is that there's a lot of repairing that needs to take place in society because of decades and and in fact centuries old oppression uh which obviously if you are a guy born in the past 20 years you had no role in that you are benefiting for somewhat from that because society in so many ways even if you're just looking at the healthcare system is built to benefit and towards a certain demographic of people I, i i think that's something that um unfortunately for like much younger people it feels very literal and it feels incredibly real because there's this like negativity and this hate that is really needs to be channeled towards institutions but in the school playground it's being channeled towards individuals i think that's kind of one part of it i think that message gets mixed really easily and and it can be really toxic um i think there's so many factors that pull into this uh but with society kind of trying to um you know to to fix something so big you kind of if, if society is on one end of a spectrum now and we want it to be you know somewhere in the middle between extreme and where we are now you do kind of have to swing a second to extreme to get to a new normal that's kind of i think we saw that with covid right it was very drastic extreme measures at the beginning which were not sustainable but that i know this is so random to go into covid now but it took it then enabled society to get to a point that was a kind of eventually a healthy in the middle that then helped whilst vaccines were being prepared and you know it, it felt something more achievable for people you know you weren't locked inside every single hour of every single day you went outside of it i know nathan's got his opinions on how the government handled covid but we don't have to get into that today um i think in society in general we have the same thing where like we take a very extreme swing because people are angry and frustrated and change needs to happen today and when change needs to happen today it's not nuanced it it is taking a big sledgehammer to you know something very very delicate but and there are unfortunately along the way you know issues that evolve that impact people who are, who are for the most part really innocent in this um but i don't know i guess the hope is that this will resolve itself as so many things in society do and maybe final thoughts nathan and then anishka yeah i mean it's an interesting point about having this kind of pendulum going from one extreme to the other and i, I think we've kind of reached that peak on the masculinity with andrew tate and acknowledging that yeah this is kind of the the ultra form of the real toxic masculinity that's obviously as you say in relation to covid and lockdowns is unsustainable and we're starting to move back to that point and i think we are getting to a point also and covid did highlight this the fact about 
you know, white working class boys being left behind in education. More is being done to address that. I know there's a few universities actually offering bespoke scholarships towards addressing, trying to address that issue as well, to try and encourage white working class boys to go to university, not just go down the route of, say, their father or grandfather of going straight into work, straight into industry and working for the remainder of their life for the next 60, 70 years. So you, you are right, James. You, the, the, we are starting to see movements on that. We are starting to see an equilibrium on that. But certainly there needs to be a great acknowledgement of some of the issues that men face in society, in my view. And Anushka, final thoughts? Yeah, I think with what you said, James, about the fact that it sort of has, you know, we tend to swing in extremes when we're so when we're yearning for that change um i think it's really important to highlight that because that's obviously i think what's happened um but i think through working towards you know a change where there is that equilibrium 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 sorry and that balance um i think that it is just about you know it's recognizing what's happened, not imposing upon upon you know young men nowadays, but also just allowing them to be who they want to be. Because throughout all of this, you know, it would be we do also live in a time where we're celebrating individuality. So we can't. I think it's unfair to be hypocritical and say you know, or for for young guys to feel like I can't do this, I can't do that anymore, but out of fear of this, no you know, capitalize upon what is also being taught to you and and, and exposed to you now that we're celebrating you as an individual. So if you as an individual feel like you are, um, you're operating from, from, you know, just how you are as a person, as long as it's healthy and it's not hurting anybody else, I don't think there needs to be too much sort of unpicking and dissecting. Um, it's just about, yeah, being a respectful person to to, to to the opposite gender really, or another person. Yeah. Well, that yeah. is all the time we have for today on doing the thing i uh, thank you anushka and nathan um where can our listeners find you nathan uh well listeners can find me every sunday afternoon on wizard radio station on the nathan eckersley show alternatively you can find me on twitter at nat underscore Eck. and anushka what about you well you can find me on sundays as well at 7 p.m live and you can also find me on instagram using anushka underscore free amazing remember to catch new episodes to doing the thing live on wizard radio station every sunday from 8 p.m uk and on all podcast platforms for monday morning we'll see you next week Everyone is talking about magnesium. It's all you hear about. But why? What do we know about magnesium? Well, magnesium is the number one mineral that 75% of Americans are deficient in. If you are a woman over 35, magnesium will help you rediscover balance, energy, and vitality. Magnesium supports more than 300 enzymatic reactions in your body, including those involved in hormonal balance. From functional medicine doctors to mental well-being and female hormone experts, we all know that magnesium is the one mineral to improve all aspects of well-being and health. But which one? Magnesium Breakthrough from Bioptimizers. The trusted choice recommended by leading experts with seven best-absorbed forms of magnesium to ensure your body receives the support it needs for overall well-being. Go to bioptimizers.com balance today and use code BALANCE10 for 10% off. Support your journey to wellness at B-I-O-P-T-I-M-I-Z-E-R-S dot com forward slash balance. Magnesium Breakthrough from Bioptimizers, your foundation to optimal health and vitality. I'm Victoria Cash. Thanks for calling the Lucky Land Hotline. If you feel like you do the same thing every day, press 1. If you're ready to have some serious fun for the chance to redeem some serious prizes, press 2. We heard you loud and clear. So go to LuckyLandslots.com right now and play over 100 social casino-style games for free. Get lucky today at LuckyLandslots.com. Available to players in the U.S., excluding Washington and Michigan. No purchase necessary. VGW Group. Void were prohibited by law. 18 plus. Terms and conditions apply.